Okay. Hi, everybody. A couple of announcements to uh, go ahead and get started with. Um, first of all, you may notice I don't have a stack of exams with me. Um, I'm close. They're almost done. Um, if I didn't have, I, I was like, I'll, I should tell them I'll have them done by the end of the day. And then I remembered I have meetings later today. And so I was like, okay, that's probably not true. But um, I think that actually by lab tomorrow is probably quite likely. Um, so they're, they're coming soon. Um, just a couple of general things to point out. Um, one, uh, on this exam, the multiple choice seemed to be either you really got it or you really didn't. Um, if the reason why I put multiple choice questions on these exams is because many of the things you're going to do after this involve you having to take multiple choice exams. And many of those multiple choice exams are higher level multiple choice questions. And so I'm trying to give you practice at that. If you um, look at the multiple choice questions and you feel like you're really, it's not working out for you, um, come by and we can talk about strategies. Um, this may be because of age thing or that I went to high school in New York State, which is like really into multiple choice tests, but like taking multiple choice tests was like this thing I got so very specialized on at one point in my life. And so um, if you want to talk through the strategies of how you deal with them, if it's clearly not something that is your strength, come talk to me, please. Um, the other thing I want you to remember um, is that if you actually look at sort of the literature on learning and the literature on sort of cognition and how stuff like that works, um, part of learning stuff is about learning it and like getting it in your brain, like putting it in the file cabinets of your brain. <laughs> um, but part of it is also about being able to actually know, oh, right now I'm supposed to apply this fact. And I need to look in drawer number 17B <laughs> for this fact. It's about finding the fact and being able to pull it back out. A lot of study strategies that people use practice the first part of that, the throwing things into the brain, and don't ever practice the pulling things back out. That's why I give you so many practice exams, because I want you to be able to practice doing questions. Um, and so I would strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that you should be studying with those practice exams and other practice materials to practice that part of the learning process of actually finding material in your brain and getting it out. Um, you know that some professors give you a like index card or a cheat sheet that you get to use. There, there's actually a secret about that. Index cards and cheat sheets are actually not that useful. But the thing that is incredibly useful is having to go through the information and decide what's the most important. So actually, the thing that's useful in that is making the cheat sheet or making the index card. If you say, I'm going to make a 27-page study sheet and write every single thing down, you didn't prioritize. And that actually doesn't work as well as having to prioritize and be like, this amount of material, I have to decide what is the most important. So realize that the more of that kind of stuff you can do instead of just the, let me try to bring it all in, practice getting it out, practice um, prioritizing is going to help a lot. Um, and again, I'm not totally done yet, but I think we're going to have a big spread. Um, we'll see. There's, there's one question that was worth two points. And as I was grading it, it, it made the whole part a 19 point part. And I was like, this is really dumb. I don't know who thought this was a two point question. It's clearly a three point question. So like, I just made it a three point question and that's out of 20. And if someone ends up with 101, someone will end up with 101. So we're just going that way. <laughs> um, and like I said, I'll probably, I should have everything um, done by lab tomorrow. Also speaking of lab tomorrow, um, in lab tomorrow, we are doing a lab report workshop. Um, and your lab report draft is due. I would like you to, ha to turn your lab report draft in by emailing a copy to me and bring a hard copy so that we have a hard copy that we can work on um, during the, 
the session, but so that I also have an electronic copy that I can use for grading. If bringing a hard copy is going to be a problem, email me sort of maybe before noon with your copy and tell me so that I can make sure that we have a hard copy for you, OK? But I would like a hard copy and an electronic copy um, of your lab reports tomorrow. OK. Are there other things we need to talk about? OK. Um, so today I want to uh, finish talking about uh, some things related to immune memory um, and immune response kinetics, specifically going uh, into a couple of different scenarios, um, partially because they're interesting and important and things that you've probably thought about or seen in your life, and I want to show you actually how it pulls together with things we've been learning, partially because they are things that are in sort of the general discussion about immunology. And then we're going to move into um, thinking about barrier immunity. Um, and so the first example um, sort of scenario that I want to talk about is related to um, immune response kinetics. And I'm going to first uh, do some sort of drawing of some specific, some kind of circumstances of this um, on the board. Sometimes uh, in the past, students have laughed at me when going through some parts of this scenario that like they feel like they're getting a therapy session and that I need to like learn to give up, to get over some things. So it's okay, it's gonna be fine. We are going to imagine first a situation where a person, and I usually use my mom as the example here because it's gonna be sort of a person who is a bit older than me. <laughs> Um, gets infected with a particular virus. And we're going to call this virus November pox. So, some, so we're, it's just sort of a virus. <laughs> uh, I, I want it to be vague at the moment. Okay, and so we're going to imagine my mom's life <laughs> and no, with November pox. The x-axis here is going to be time. The y-axis is going to be the size of the specific adaptive immune response to this microbe. If you would like it to be an antibody response, it could be an antibody response. If you would like it to be a T-cell response, it could be a T-cell response. It's sort of similar to what we're seeing here, but we're going to draw it out and think about a few other things. Um, so we'll imagine that to start out with, my mom has a competent immune system as far as we know. So she did some BDJ recombination and she had like one T cell, in my mind it's usually a T cell, but it could be whatever, uh, responding to this microbe, Very you know, right? And eventually, at some point in her life, she got infected with November pox. And there was a little bit of a delay. And then she made a primary immune response that contracted down. So here is her primary immune response, right? And she probably had some disease. She probably had some symptoms. Then sometime, Later in her life, maybe some other kid in her neighborhood had November pox. And she hung out with them. And she was exposed to the virus from them. So her body saw this virus again. She had a little bit of an infection. So she gets infected again. Now, she's going to make a secondary response. I don't know why that's, that probably should be broader too. Broader. There. <laughs> okay, now she makes a secondary response. Hooray. Now, and what you'll notice is that, you know, the response, any of these responses, do come down over time. 
And if I were going to sort of draw this out forever and ever and ever over time, it would be almost like asymptotic. Like it would never quite get all the way to zero, but it would, it would decline a bit over time. And so you can see kind of this declining over time out here. But we're not going to necessarily draw her declining over time because she went to school. And then as she got a little older, she started babysitting. And sometime when she was babysitting, one of those little nasty kids she was babysitting probably had this pox, right? And so she got infected again. And she made a tertiary immune response, even higher, even better, right? And now it's going to keep declining from here. Well, then at some point, she had me. And I got this pox virus. So she got it again when she was taking care of me. <laughs> and so she got a quaternary, like an even higher and better response, right? And at some point she had my sister. And then I run on a chalkboard. And height. <laughs> and so we have a, a you know, we can imagine a peak really high. And we can imagine, like, there's my response kind of undergoing attrition <laughs> coming down, right? So now let's think about her today. Let's imagine that she comes in contact with this virus today. Do you think she is going to get sick with this virus if she gets this virus today? What do you think, Kat? No, no why not? She has this amazing memory response. I can't even draw that high. Her memory response is so good. And maybe what it turns out to be is that, like, if you have a, enough of a, a response sort of above this line, you're protected from disease. If your response is below this line, you're not protected. So at the beginning, during that primary response, she was below what's known as the threshold for immunity. So she was, wasn't protected. But now you can see she's protected afterwards. And even if, as an older person, immune responses do decline, um, your immune responses just generally decline. So if, even if we like brought this down a bit because she was older, even if she never sees this virus again, she is probably never going to have her immune response <laughs> come all the way down to the point where it would cross that dotted line, if I drew the dotted line all the way across. She is probably never going to get symptoms and get sick with this in her whole life. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep, Karen. So part of it is going to be about, um, well, I, I'm going to show you one other example um, in a second. But part of it is going to be about, makes it is hard to answer because what you have to say is, well, would they have gotten sicker if they didn't have a memory response, right? Yeah. And so unless you have, you know, two parallel universes where you can have them, you know, in either situation, it's hard to totally answer that question. Some of that is going to be due to other uh, factors in terms of their health and how their immune response is working, how well we're keeping immune responses staying at high levels, um, as well as some other things that we'll talk about a bit later about um, why you might make good or bad responses, um, which we'll talk about over the No, so an autoimmune response specifically means a response against a self-antigen. An immunodeficient response means that you don't have enough of an immune response. So it would be an immunodeficiency, not autoimmune. 
All right, so like I said, this is my mom, okay? Now we're gonna look at me. I also was infected with this virus at one point in my life. In fact, since I'm so we're still calling this a vague virus, November pox, um, although I'm imagining a real virus in my head. And that vi I got that one in spring of 1985. I can tell you that right now. I made an immune response to it. Da at some point, I was around some other kid who had this virus. So I made a memory response, right? Then there was a vaccine invented for this virus. I have never in my life met another person with this virus, which means I have never gotten exposed again. So while my mom had those many different exposures that pushed her immune response really, really high so that as it declined over time, she was okay, I'm declining from here. <laughs> I haven't had any sort of protection from my community. And so, while she was probably never going to get to the point of being susceptible because her immune response did, wouldn't ever decline that much, mine didn't ever get as high. And so mine could actually decline to the point where I might get sick. Um, the people who were younger than me who got vaccinated are good because the vaccine is going to give them some long lasting protection. But I'm in this like age window of people who are sad <laughs> and people who are potentially at risk. Does that all make sense? Okay, so this is actually a real scenario, but there's one other piece to the scenario um, that I have to, that complicates it, which is why I didn't do that piece first. Um, this is actually a scenario that is really happening with a virus known as varicella zoster virus. Um, varicella zoster virus is a virus that you can be infected with um, via the conjunctiva or respiratory tract. Um, it will eventually um, infect um, some cells and go to the skin to make a rash. Um, and that rash is referred to as chickenpox. So it's a chickenpox virus. I had a chicken pox. That's exactly what happens. Um, in fact, really interestingly, um, one thing that was talked about a lot when I was a kid and everyone used to get the chicken pox all the time was that how you should get the chicken pox when you're a kid because it's more severe in adults than it is in kids. It turns out the reason for that is that chicken pox virus uses memory T cells to get to the skin. So kids have fewer memory T cells, adults have more. So it's more severe in adults. So this scenario is exactly the scenario with chicken pox. But the thing that is unique about chicken pox virus is that it is a type of virus known as a latent virus. That means once you are infected with this virus, it never goes away. It is in your body for the rest of your life. Most uh, pathogens go away. They are called acute infections. This is a latent infection. It stays in you for the rest of your life. Um, it stays in, I believe it's about 1% to 7% of neurons. So some percent of my neurons have this virus in them. And that virus is doing absolute right now. And I'm good. I'm fine. The reason why I'm fine is because my immune response, my memory response, is high enough. But if my immune response dips, if my immune response gets below a certain level, then that virus is not going to stay controlled anymore in my body. And if that virus goes out of control in my body, 
It is going to cause symptoms known as shingles. That's what shingles is. A shingles is chickenpox reactivation. Basically, the virus comes back down the nerve and start, makes a new rash. Um, so, are you worried about my mom getting shingles? You're shaking your head no. Why not? Yeah, Michael. She had lots and lots and lots of exposures to this virus from being in the community. She got a primary and a secondary and technically a tertiary and a quaternary. And she got this super high immune response from community exposures. So even as that response declines, she's going to be OK. People my age are the poster children for going to get shingles. <laughs> because we had chicken pox. We didn't actually get to be the people who had the chickenpox vaccine. But then we haven't ever run into people with chickenpox again. And so our immune responses have been declining over time. Um, and it's rather likely that at some point our immune responses will decline to the point where um, we're getting shingles. So you can see that there, there are actually more, more and more shingles cases in different adults. If you actually look at the recommendations, the age recommendation is dropping. So like it used to be just really old people, but now it's like younger and younger people because there are fewer and fewer, fewer community exposures um, for dealing with shingles. Good news, we have a way to protect one against shingles. The way we protect you against shingles is we give you a chickenpox vaccine or a shingles vaccine, but it's really the chickenpox. It's actually the chickenpox vaccine at double dose. It's a 2x chickenpox vaccine. That's all the shingles vaccine is. And it's just to give you an extra boost to keep you above that level of immunity. Um, and so again, they've been taking the rec recommended age for shingles vaccines and reducing it and reducing it and reducing it. I'm not quite there yet, but eventually I'll probably have to get a shingles vaccine um, because I had chicken pox, but I um, am not getting these community exposures. Yep, Michael. Um, I think that we had they hadn't really thought about that in the same way, and I don't think they'd real th it was sort of a realization of that happening. You know, the shingles in general isn't going to happen until you're generally in your in sort of I would say like 40s, 50s. I I say that I would say 50s plus, but I know people who've had it in their 40s, so that's why I said it that way. But um, so you know, when I was 15. I don't remember. That's around how old I was when the chickenpox vaccine was coming out. No one was like, "Oh, we should. We're going to worry about her getting the shingles later." Because at the same time, they're also like, "That's 30 years from now. Maybe we should give her a vaccine in 20 years, not now, and make it wait 30 years." Christina. Um, so, if someone were to get the vaccine instead of mom, mm -hmm. would that stimulate the, a response? Yeah, you could stimulate a very good response um, if you got the vaccine multiple times. Absolutely, same kind of thing. Um, and so what you can also see is that eventually when, peop when nobody gets chicken pox anymore, we're not going to really worry about the shingles because no one's going to have that virus inside their body forever and ever. But there's this lovely group of us <laughs> in sort of this gap period um, that have to worry about this. So I wanted to kind of talk about this as it is an important consequence of immune memory. One other thing that I just want to mention briefly, um, since I am talking about um, zoster um, or chickenpox virus, is that um, one other kind of complication that could come up in some of these memory responses um, is that when you have an infection that is chronic, um, that is lasting for a long period of time, the immune response to it does change over time. So here you can see sort of a virus, um, this is a different virus, CMV, that lasts for a long period of time. And those, and the T cells and other immune cells that are responding to that um, over a long period of time may go to a state known as chronic exhaustion. Um, and so um, when the, the microbe is present for a long period of time, we also might see this uh, exhaustion phenotype, which is another complicating factor. 
that I just wanted to mention. All right. So there's one other sort of scenario issue that I want to talk about um, that is related to immune response kinetics and sort of consequences of memory responses. This one I am like feeling so uncertain about talking about um, for a couple reasons. Um, and a big part of it is because this, again, touches on that topic that I mentioned last time of sort of immune imprinting um, that lots of people are talking about with, you know, if you have the original SARS-CoV-2, what happens with Omicron and blah, 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 and should you get the vaccine with this sequence or that? You, all of those arguments that are out there. Um, that came up with the memory B cell uh, data. It's going to come up in this example as well. And I'm going to show you a very famous example. And first of all, this, this issue is complicated. Second of all, I'm going to largely be showing you information um, when I give you the scenario and then one part of it that I talk through that's related to influenza. And it is actually pretty well, some of this is well worked out for influenza. If you remember, I said last time, people who are saying too much about immune imprinting in SARS-CoV-2, I don't necessarily think that they totally know what they're talking about. That does not mean that like immune imprinting is not a thing in the influenza case. My point is it's a lot more complicated than that and we need a lot more to, I don't know that we can like extrapolate to all of immunology but there are certainly some principles that I want you to see um, in this case about memory responses. Some of this, in fact, um, will bear on Karen May's question. Um, and this is also something that bears on um, a general thought that comes up a lot um, when thinking about immune responses to infection. So one of the things that comes up, and we'll see this in lots of different ways throughout this, the rest of the semester, is why is it that if I were to infect each of you with an identical virus, no, I am not going to infect each of you with an identical virus, that would be unethical, but if I went around and infected all of you, same dose, same virus, like I had, same exact virus, I would get different symptoms among all of you. I would get potentially different disease. Why do we see this dramatic variation in disease? Yep? Because um, everybody has been exposed to different things, so their immune, uh, immune response like differently for everything. So that's in fact right where I'm going. Um, but some other answers just to point out are things like you all have different MHC types. And so you're each going to be presenting different antigens and making different T cell responses. And some of your T cell responses will be better than others because of the MHC types you have and the peptides you present. So that's already one reason why we might see variation. But in fact, as Karame notes, another aspect of this is actually your infection history um, and what things you have been infected with. Um, sometimes, in addition to this being referred to as the immune imprinting problem, this is also referred to as the problem of original antigenic sin. Um, so this is this consequence of memory responses. And we're going to look at this with this little sample virus here, which I'm going to think of as influenza because this phenomenon is particularly well described with influenza. So when I think about it, I think about flu. Um, and we can imagine a person who gets infected with influenza. And that influenza virus has four epitopes, A, B, C, and D. And so when we are infected, with influenza, we make a primary response to epitope A, and a primary response to epitope B, and a primary response to epitope C, and a primary response to epitope D. You can see a drawing of a primary response over on the board if you forgot what they look like. And that primary response takes a little while. 
It's not the super high level, particularly not at the beginning. You're going to get kind of sick from this virus. You, you might be in bed for a while. This says you're going to be in bed for 14 days. Some of these other days in bed I don't totally love, but the 14 days I'm good with. <laughs> you're going to be sick. It's going to be bad. It's terrible. Now, you survive. Hooray. And another year happens, and you get infected again with influenza virus. But this virus has undergone some mutation. So that now it, again, has four epitopes, but they are epitopes A, B, C, and E. So we've had a mutation and changed this epitope. When that happens, what we might see is a situation where this is the second time you've seen antigen A. You're going to make a secondary response to antigen A. It's going to be amazing. It's the second time you've seen antigen B. You're going to get a secondary response to B. Second time you've seen C, you're going to make a secondary response to C. Hooray! Those responses are going to be really fast and really effective. And they're going to be so fast and so effective that you're never even going to get around to making a primary response to E. Remember, a primary response has like a little bit of a delay to it. That, you're not even going to have to be waiting that long. The virus is going to be cleared before you even got there. So you're never going to make a response to E. You're not going to know you had this infection. I say zero days in bed. You're going to never even know it happened. Woohoo! OK, the third year, you're going to get infected again. Again, the virus is going to have undergone some additional mutation. And so now, the virus that's circulating this year will have uh, epitopes A, B, E, and F. You're going to make, in fact, a tertiary response to A. It's the third time you've seen A. You're going to make a great response. Remember how the big stuff I drew on the board to A. You're going to make a similarly great response to B. It's the second time you've seen E. But you didn't even make a primary the first time. So you can't make a secondary without a primary. And you're not going to make a primary this time either. Because you got rid of that virus way too quick. You're not going to make a response to F either. Nothing. S still zero days in bed. Still don't even know this happened to you. You get infected again the next year, because this is just a virus that circulates through your community. It's undergone some mutation. So now it has epitopes A, G, E, and F. It's the fourth time you've seen A. You're going to make a huge response to A. It's going to totally protect you. You're not even going to get around to making any of these other responses. Now we have the fifth year. You get infected again. You've been infected five times now. But this fifth time, there's been enough mutation that now you have four completely different epitopes. So this is the fourth time you've seen antigen E. But you never made a primary response to E before. So now you're going to make a primary response. And you're going to make a primary to F, and G, and H. Even though you've seen some of those before. Because you were, had these other memory responses sort of swamping out those primary responses, you didn't make them, so you're only going to make them now. And you're going to end up being really, really sick while um, uh, even though, again, you've seen some of these before. And so now let's imagine, say, a pair of siblings. One sibling got infected this year, and two, three, four, five. One sibling didn't get number one, but did get the other ones. They both get this identical virus. You can even imagine they're identical twins if we want. What's going to happen to the one? So the one who has, who is getting this as number five, is going to be really sick, right? What's going to happen to the one who's getting this as number four? 
they're going to be they're going to be in this situation. They're going to be fine because they're making the quaternary response to E because they didn't have at this point this infection to swamp them out this time. So this time that person got really sick. Their twin did not. Now the other way around. And it's all based on the history of your infections. And so which infections you've had in the past may lead to some memory responses that will change what your outcome is, even if infected with the exact same pathogen. So this is kind of the general phenomenon. Um, it gets a little bit trickier when we get into what's going on with actual pathogens in real life. And one of the reasons for this is because as much as we talk about, and as, as this is totally true, in an immune response, um, we have um, this exquisite specificity of the adaptive immune system. Sometimes there are microbes that have similar epitopes or even the same epitopes. So here you can see two viruses, cowpox and smallpox, and you can see that some of their epitopes are similar. They both have blue triangle. They both have green humpy thing. Um, and they also have some unique epitopes. And so in fact, if you make an immune response to one, because of shared epitopes, you will get immune responses to the others. And so this previous example showed you what would happen if it was the same exact microbe over and over again with your infection history. But in reality, similar related microbes could give you the same kind of phenomena. Um, and so what, if you happen to weirdly be infected with some other cross-reactive microbe, that could influence your responses. Perhaps you have a memory response where other people have um, a primary response. This is something that is debated a lot in the field in a lot of ways. One of the ways, and I will say there is no good answer to this one, so I, I, I'm just going to tell you the, the, the question. We don't know the answer. Um, there are four coronaviruses that normally circulate in the population that you've all been infected with. Um, there may be some cross-reactivity between SARS-CoV-2 and those. And so whether or not you have severe COVID with SARS-CoV-2 infection might be related to what kind of memory responses you have to those other um, coronaviruses. And for a lot of reasons, we can't really do the experiments that would totally prove that. And so the answer is, but it's uh, debated all the time. Um, weirdly enough, even if we look at viruses in some cases that aren't even closely related, so this is talking about two different viruses um, that are like not related at all. Um, LCMV and Pekinde virus, not that you care. It turns out they have a similar peptide that happens to be a cross-reactive epitope. They make similar responses. And so if a person or a mouse has LCMV, mostly they response, respond to this peptide, NP396. <laughs> and it's really good. And then second most is GP33, and second next is GP276, and next is NP205. But because of cross-reactivity, if those mice had this other virus, not related, to random virus, we never expected this would happen, they had Pekinde first, well, now they mostly make a response to NP205, which is not as good at controlling the virus. So they have a different outcome just because of their past infection history. Um, so this is sort of all a consequence of immune memory and is also all um, related to um, reasons why in a population we're all gonna have different responses to the same infection because some of us are gonna have different infection histories. Um, as I said, this is uh, particularly well worked out with influenza. Um, so this is sort of one of the really important studies looking at this with influenza. Um, there are a bunch of genetic types of this one key influenza protein. 
And you can divide them into group one and group two. That's really what's important here, <laughs> is that you can sort of divide influenzas into group ones and group twos in terms of this protein HA. And if we actually look over time, we see that the predominant type of influenza changes from time to time. Um, you m probably remember the H1N1 swine flu epidemic in 2009-2010. It was unfun. One thing that actually, but one thing that we observed during that time is if we, when we looked, there were actually really few cases in the elderly. Why? Because the elderly had previously been infected with a similar H1N1 virus. Um, but those who were born a little bit later had not. They had been infected with a different virus that had been predominating. So different age groups seem to have had their first influenza be a different kind. And we noticed that that actually led to some protection in uh, the swine flu pandemic. We've also seen, and, and these, these influenzas that um, we see um, circulating can, be, can fall into that same group one and group two. So some of us, our first influenza was a group one, and some of us, our first influenza was a group two. There are other influenza viruses that infectious disease professionals have, have wondered might cause a pandemic. In fact, if you asked any infectious disease person before 2020 what was going to be the next big scary pandemic, I'm pretty sure everybody would have told you influenza was the thing they were most worried about. There are these influenza strains that we've been tracking for a really long time, and we're sort of like, when is it coming? When is it coming? There's a lot of reasons why people are like, it's influenza, the next influenza is coming. So there's some that we track. Um, one is called H7N9. Um, I will admit, I find the H7N9 data a little scary. Turns out that h 7 N9 um, is in group two. There's another one that people worry about called H5N1. It's in group one. And it turns out people who were previously, whose first influenzas were a group one, seems to be really protected against group ones. So it looks like people who were born before 1968 <laughs> had their first influenza be a group one. And so they're probably going to be OK if there was ever an H5N1 pandemic. But if there's an H7N2, which is a group 2, they're in bad shape. However, all of us very young people who were born after 1968 um, had our first influenza be a group 2. And so we're probably most likely to make a really good response against group two influenzas. So if there is an H7N9, we're probably going to be OK. But if there's an H5N1, a group one, we're going to be out of luck. Um, and so this sort of idea is kind of what people are thinking about when they're thinking about past infections and immune imprinting leading to changes in disease. Um, it took a lot of years to figure this out. Um, and so I think that. Like I said, I'm not sure we can totally extrapolate it from flu um, because of some unique things going on with flu. Um, but this is sort of what we know about this. All right, so switching gears, um, we're now going to spend the rest of today um, and some amount of time on Friday talking a little bit about barrier immunity. Um, you saw this slide on the second-ish day of class where we talked about the barrier defenses as one of the three levels of immunity. Um, and specifically here, we can think about sort of 
the barrier organs, um, which you can see here and which I'll also say more about on the um, next slide. But what you can, but we've got all of these organs, the skin, the mouth, the stomach, the intestine, the airway and the lungs, the urogenital tract, et cetera, that are sort of important and unique in being specialized to keep pathogens out, yay. But they're also pretty unique because they're in contact with the outside world 24 seven. They are going to be getting exposed to pathogens all the time. Your lungs always have, are, deal, are like 24 seven dealing with some microbe, as is your skin, as are all of these others. And so the specific responses that are happening sort of at these barrier organs are both special in terms of making sure we keep things from going further <laughs> and into other organs that should not have microbes in them, um, but also just in terms of the way that they are, are specialized. Um, one way that this happens is by having special types of cells in all of these barrier tissues that are going to allow us to um, block um, microbes from going any further. Almost everything I tell you about barrier tissues is going to be about mucosal tissues. Um, part of that is for time reasons, it's for a lot of reasons. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about skin specifically here, though like I said, we are mostly going to be talking about mucosal tissues. I also want you to notice that even though we talk about mucosal tissues, there are different types of mucosal tissues. All mucosal areas are not exactly the same. Um, we're going to largely be using the intestine as our mucosal example. So know that we are oversimplifying a lot of variation. Um, one thing that is different between the skin and all of these other mucosal tissues is something that you probably take for granted. So if you think about, I don't know, the layer of cells in your mouth versus the layer of cells on your hand, what's a really, 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 don't overthink this, obvious difference? I picked mouth for a reason. Okay, even simpler. If I asked a four-year-old what was the difference between the mouth and the hands, what would they say? Yeah. Nope. Michael. Your mouth is wet. Your skin's dry. <laughs> right? Most of our mucosal tissues are a uh, sort of wetter atmosphere. Um, compared to the skin atmosphere. And in fact, this top layer of cells in the skin that's quite dry is also actually dead cells. So the very top layer of the skin is dead cells. I said this during a COVID talk a couple years ago and someone, I saw someone's notes afterwards and their notes said that I said that skin was dead. All of skin is not dead. All of these layers are not dead, just the very top. <laughs> Um, that's actually really important for me as a person who thinks about viruses, because viruses can't use dead cells, because they need to take advantage of the cells' processes. So uh, this is actually, that's actually a pretty good barrier, just to have a bunch of dead cells there first that a microbe can't take advantage of. Um, and there are other sort of important aspects of the skin as a barrier tissue. There's one thing, however, even with our differences in types of barrier tissues that you see here, that all of our barrier tissues have in common. All of our barrier tissues have in common that they contain 
a number of uh, microbes. And so they all have a bunch of microbes that just live there. Um, they are re often referred to as our commensal microbes, though I don't love that term. And so you can see, if we look in the mouth, we are going to see a lot of this one particular type of organism, the Firmicutes, and smaller amounts of others. You can see the skin will have um, mostly actinobacteria, but any one of our barrier tissues has a full complement of commensal organisms. Um, we often can sort of divide the body into um, a few different types of habitats. We really actually use all of the language and techniques of ecology here to describe the communities in all of these different locations. And so every single one of your barrier tissues is completely covered with microbes. If, if somehow I disappeared right now, you would still see like a me-shaped pile of microbes um, that is covering my skin and my other barrier tissues. And you can see, yes, they do vary from site to site based on things like the humidity, the pH, um, nutrient levels. But we do have these organisms as a common feature of all barrier tissues. And these organisms do a number of functions. One thing that they will do for us is they actually will do synthesis of some metabolites that we need. So they are making things like vitamin K, an essential vitamin that we need. They are helping to digest some of our food. So there are foods that you eat that you actually can't digest, but the microbes can partially digest them and you can digest them once the microbes are done. Those microbes may inactivate toxins that are in your food. Um, and all of these things are part of the reason why I sort of always get cranky about calling these the commensal organisms. Commensalism is an ecology term. It means that there are two organisms interacting. One of them is benefiting. The other one has no effect. Um, I'm pretty sure the microbes are benefiting from living on your body because they're getting like nutrition and a home. And you are clearly benefiting too. You're getting metabolites or food or inactivation of stuff. So commensal is probably not the actual right ecological word. I would actually say they are probably mutualistic microbes. But you can see like in these figures, we're in, in some figure I have here, they, they, they're called commensals. And in others, they're, they're generally called commensals. I think I've lost that fight. But commensal's not really the right word. Um, those microbes are also going to be particularly important for immune system development um, and development of certain immune cells, which you can see on the uh, right. And they're also really important for one other purpose, which I think that people sometimes underestimate, um, that's shown here, um, which is known as colonization resistance. So we have these green microbes. They're your nice, friendly microbes. They're your friends. They live all over your skin, all over your GI tract, all over that. As a result, there is no open niche. The habitat's full. And so if a pathogen comes along, that pathogen has nowhere to grow because the habitat's already full. That invading per, uh, microbe cannot grow in that location. Um, and so you can kind of see this here. Normally, we have a bunch of these good bacteria, healthy bacteria, happy bacteria, that are providing colonization resistance and that are blocking this bad, harmful red bacteria from being able to get a foothold. Um, and we actually know that if, and this is, uh, this is a pretty famous disease state, if we actually get rid of those microbes and we open up that habitat, that does allow pathogens the opportunity to come in and potentially cause damage. This is most famously shown when people take a lot of antibiotics, they get rid of the microbes in their GI tract. And 
Sometimes a microbe called, called Clostridium difficile can colonize and cause really, really, really severe um, issues. And once C. diff has come in, it's almost impossible to get C. diff out. Um, so um, we should remember the importance of sort of those commensal microorganisms and the way that they are in fact protecting you. They are you you want the, to have your skin covered in commensals in your friend friendly microorganisms because they're helping you keep out the bad guys um, to keep you from having problems. Yep, Karame. It, it is, um, and so um, there, there's some really great stuff that's been written about this. Um, I think the, the, there's a couple New York Times articles. One is called Tending Your Body's Microbial Garden, and one is called How Microbes Defend and Define Us. I think it's the microbial garden one that uses the analogy, I'm going to say, which is, yes, antibiotics are used to kill a particular microbe because you need to get rid of, you have an infection that's making you ill. But the, the argument in that, or the analogy in that piece is that it would be this equivalent of using a nuclear bomb to weed your garden. Yes, you have something bad in there that you need to get rid of, but you're using something that kills everything. <laughs> um, and so that's a whole issue with the antibiotics field that is, you know, that's microbiology. Um, and not immunology, but um, you know, with the antibiotics, you are yes, you are taking it, but many of our antibiotics work very broadly, kill all the microbes, including the good ones. Um, if some of you have had, had micro, you will know this is where Dr. Miller and I have our debates about hand sanitizer and why I get really feisty about how I don't like hand sanitizer, because hand sanitizer just kills all the microbes that are giving you colonization resistance, and uh, dries your skin to allow more crack cracks. Wash your hands, soap and water. It's actually way better. Um, this is why if you go to the doctor's office and you're put on an antibiotic, a lot of times they might recommend eating yogurt or eating probiotics so that you can basically be flooding your body with uh, positive um, commensals. Um, so what I want you to realize is that, in fact, in a lot of ways, these microbes are part of our immune system in these barrier tissues by providing us um, this colonization and resistance. Different uh, studies have come up with different numbers here. The number is not important, but you can see that there are some people who used to talk about the idea that, in fact, if we looked at on a cell by cell basis, you have 10 times as many bacteria cells as you have U cells in you. Um, you it's at least a kilogram of bacteria. Um, and if the particular microbes in your body shift, um, that can be associated with different disease states. So here you can see both healthy controls and patients um, and particular microbes that are found in each case. Um, I will admit, sometimes people look at this and they're like, why is the healthy control in necrotizing enterocolitis look so different than the other healthy controls? The answer is because necrotizing enterocolitis only happens in babies. So this is a baby and these are adults. Um, but um, if the particular microbes that live in association with your body shift, you may end up with some kind of disease state. Um, also, if you have certain disease states that might shift the microbes, sometimes it's hard to determine cause and effect. Um, and there has been a whole industry that has come up around this <laughs> um, and the idea of um, the importance of kind of tending to the microbes of your body. Um, so. Those microbes are actually playing important roles in how they interact with the immune system. If you actually want to read about this, Martin Blazer um, is like one of the pioneers of it. So that's, of all of these things, Martin Blazer's Missing Microbes is actually the one that's pretty good. And this has been a pretty hot topic um, in the fields for a long time. And one of the ways that we have studied this topic and one of the ways that we have learned about this is that we actually have figured out a way to make mice that have no microbes. So most labs are what are, have what are known as specific pathogen-free facilities. You keep out the really bad microbes, 
but like the ones on the researcher's hands or face come in and like the mice are going to get them. So the mice have some microbes associated with them. Just not really bad stuff. And so the mice stay pretty healthy. However, we have figured out the way to make mice that are notobiotic or germ-free. These mice actually are um, bred entirely inside of these uh, sterile uh, isolators. Um, they are conceived inside of the isolators up the way to um, they're delivered by C-section so that they can't get any uh, microbes from the mom and then they live their whole life here so they are never colonized by a microbe. Um, so they are germ-free, officially notobiotic mice. And um, when we actually look at germ-free mice, um, there are all sorts of reasons why people came up with germ-free mice, but some things were noticed. Um, A, anatomically, you could see some big differences. Um, one of them is that those mice have what is listed here as enlarged cecum. Um, that's their appendix, the appendix of a mouse. This is, this is what that means. This compared to that. And, and honestly, whenever I have, have looked at a uh, germ free mice, it was green too. Like, it just looks wrong. Um, they ha their intestine is a uh, different length, and many of their secondary lymphoid organs are not developed correctly. And if we look at their immune system, we see that that lack of microbes has dramatically influenced the immune system of those germ free mice. And so in fact, all of those commensal microbes are playing incredibly important roles in helping to ensure that, as you can see here, we get our immune system, particularly our gut-associated lymphoid tissue, developed correctly. Um, this is not to say, and we'll do, talk about this more when we talk about allergy, this is not to say that like things should be I'll deal with this with allergy and the hygiene hypothesis and how much cleanliness is too much cleanliness. But in any case, um, germ-free mice in bad shape. Um, much of this is sort of a little bit tricky to work out. Um, is it that the microbes are driving differences in the immune system? Are changes in the immune system changing the microbes? Are changes in the immune system changing the endocrine system? Endocrine system. Are changes in the endocrine system changing the immune system? Are the microbes impacting the endocrine system? Is the endocrine system changing the microbes? Um, so it gets kind of difficult. Um, what we do know is that. Um, we get a lot of small molecules that are being made by certain microbes that have effects both on endocrine cells and immune cells. And so many microbial products can start to influence um, endocrine uh, system, energy harvest, metabolism, but also inflammation. And so we start to see all of these things kind of coming together. Um, and so what you should notice here is that um, we are getting big impacts of these uh, microbes on our barrier tissues. And no matter which barrier tissue we are talking about, that is an important aspect of the barrier tissue. On Friday, we're going to go specifically into more details of the mucosal surfaces and the mucosal tissues. Um, and I'm probably just going to finish these slides on Friday instead of um, trying to cram something else at the end. Uh, so we'll just talk about mucosal tissues on Friday um, when you will get to see exciting things like this. I was so excited when I found that image. Um, so uh, I will see you guys tomorrow in lab. Please make sure that you have a hard copy and an electronic copy of your lab report. Um, and I should have exams for you by then.